Uh, take your Bibles and let's turn to the book of 1 Peter chapter 2. Uh, we are working our way through this book. I'm taking it in larger chunks uh, than I did, say, Ecclesiastes, for example. Remember where we would spend maybe uh, uh, a week and we'd get through maybe two verses? I'm taking it a little bit more broadly uh, as we go through uh, the book of 1 Peter here. And one of the things you've got to love about preaching through a book is you don't skip, you know, uh, the main points. You're just going verse by verse or section by section. Honestly, there are many pastors that would take this section and they would skip it. Because who wants to hear about submission? Is that your favorite word? Is that your favorite topic? Uh, probably not. Because for most people, it certainly isn't. It's not something that is valued uh, here in this world. It's not something that many folks would consider important. And so because of that, uh, we will resist the entire idea. And it would be very easy just to kind of skirt around that very topic because, boy, uh, as a pastor, who likes to preach submission? As somebody who is in the congregation, who likes to hear about it? right? But here's the thing, Scripture has much to say about it, and if, if God, through the work of his Holy Spirit, thought it was important enough to put here, then we need to put it out for us as well, right? And so as we look here into this chapter, we're going to see that really submission is going to be the central theme of, of this chapter and this section. So this week we'll be dealing with government right? And the authority that God has given to the government and what our response is to that, not next week, but the week after that, uh, we'll be looking at a submission in the marriage relationship and, and what God's Word has to say about that. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you this, next week we're having a baptism service. Amen? Amen! Amen. We're going to have us a baptism service, and so we're going to take a break from First Peter, and uh, we, are, we are going to uh, really focus on baptism next week. I am so excited about that and looking forward to that, uh, and then we'll pick up the following week. So First Peter chapter 2, I'd like to read verses 11 uh, through 25 as we get started this morning. It says this, Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh, which wage war against your soul. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable, so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. It says to be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be to the emperor as supreme or to governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good. For this is the will of God, that by doing good you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. We're going to touch on that in just a minute, okay? Because that's, that's very important. Uh, it says, live as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but living as servants of God. Honor everyone, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the emperor. Servants, be subject to your masters with all respect, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the unjust. For this is a gracious thing when, mindful of God, one endures sorrow while suffering unjustly. For what credit is it if, when you sin and are beaten for it, you endure? But if, when you do good and suffer for it, you endure, this is a gracious thing in the sight of God. For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example, so that you might follow in his steps. He goes on to write this, He committed no sin, Neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, 
that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed, for you were straying like sheep, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. So if we were to summarize these verses, it would go something like this. Jesus saved me through his submission so that I can serve him through my submission, right? And so as we, as we read through this, and as you look at that, at that uh, thought there in that summary, you can see that that's really true. Now, very often when, when I preach, and Scott does the same thing, and Harold does the same thing, you know what, we love to have three points in a poem. So when I say thirdly, everybody's looking at their watch going, yeah, all right, we're getting there. We don't have three points in a poem this morning. You won't know when I'm done. I may never be done. I don't know. But uh, what we have is really more observations and important truths that we find here about what biblical submission looks like. And you will recall that uh, the concept of submission that we see here uh, doesn't just mean that we submit to the things that we like, but rather that we submit. The first important principle that we see is this, being a citizen of heaven does not relieve me of my responsibility to submit to earthly authorities. So you will recall, uh, we, and we preached on this, I believe it was week one, as we went through First Peter, we are citizens of heaven, amen? Yeah. Amen, we are. That is where home is. Are we home yet? No. It reminds me of, of when I was a kid, and I was the perfect son, but my twin brother was terrible, and we'd be on a, on a trip, and my twin brother would, every few minutes, are we there yet? I never once said that. Not me. Are we there yet? You know what? As Christians, sometimes I think uh, very often our mindset is, are we there yet? Uh, we are not home. Aren't you thankful this is not all there is? Heaven awaits those who know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. But just because we are citizens of heaven does not mean that we do not have to submit to earthly authority here on earth. So in verse 11, uh, we are reminded here uh, that we are sojourners and exiles in this world. And so while we are here, the mandate is clear is that we are to submit to those who are in authority over us. We are to be subject to those human institutions that have been set up. Now, I already know where you're going with this. I don't like them. I don't agree with them. I will submit, and then we put that little word in there, but. Do you know what that little word means? It means that in your mind you are getting ready for a negotiation. We don't see that here in Scripture. We are told to submit to the human institutions that God has set up. You know what? If we want to travel to another country, there are ways to do that, right? Uh, you have to have the proper identification. You have to have the proper paperwork. Depending on where you're going, uh, you need to have the proper shots. You need to have the proper medical care. If you don't obey those laws, you could find yourself in a mess of trouble. There are profound consequences for that. The same thing is true spiritually. Although we are citizens of heaven, uh, we are commanded here to submit to those earthly authorities that have been placed where we find ourselves. Being a citizen of heaven does not take away the responsibility or it does take away the, let me start over again. Being a citizen of heaven does not relieve me of my responsibility. That's what I wanted to say, uh, to submit to earthly authority. We must do that. Secondly, Jesus is to be our example of what it means to submit biblically. 
okay? You have very often heard me say that throughout Scripture, you will find a method and a mandate for everything that is commanded in Scripture. When it comes to submission, we see exactly the same thing. Jesus is our example. The entire section from 1 Peter chapter 2, uh, verse 13 through chapter 3, deals with this idea of submission and right smack dab in the middle of this section. What we have is the fact that Jesus came into this world the one who created the world, the one who formed the authority uh, that we are to follow here on this earth, he submitted himself to human authority. As an adult, he submitted to authority. And he did that knowing full well the suffering that would take place. And so when he suffered unjustly at the hand of earthly authority, what do we see? We see that he did not rebel in any way. Uh, we see uh, that uh, he did not try to pass the buck. What did he do? He entrusted himself to his father. And it was because of that submission that we have the example, not only of what submission looks like, but we can live a life of righteousness because of what Christ has done. There's a song that uh, Ray Overholt wrote. Uh, boy, I miss him. Uh, he used to come to the radio station. We would sit down and just talk for hours. Counted him as just a dear, dear friend. Uh, he could have called 10,000 angels to do what? To destroy the world and set them free. But he died alone for you and me. See, he could have done that. He didn't. He submitted to the earthly authorities. And so we, as Christ followers, uh, we are to do exactly the same thing. We need to keep the example of Jesus before us. Thirdly, while I benefit personally from my submission, the main purpose of submission is to give glory to God. That's point number three. It is to give glory to to God. Peter doesn't really address it here, but elsewhere in Scripture we find that God places people under earthly authority for our own good. Okay? It is done with us in mind. But as Peter makes clear in his letter, our submission is not primarily about us at all, right? Very rarely is life about us. Can I say that? Are you ready for this? This might come as just a total shock to some people, but church is not about you. Mm. Worship is not about you. Worship is all about the object of our worship. And can I say, if you're coming church to church to worship yourself, you're here for the wrong reason. We come to worship God. And so it's not about you, it's all about giving glory to God. And we see uh, here throughout this passage that Peter constantly is saying our conduct must reflect the glory of God, right? And in everything that we say and in everything that we do, it's not about us, it's about giving God glory, there are crucial aspects to that kind of conduct. And so he keeps bringing things back. If you look in verse 13, it says, The reason that we are to submit is for not my sake, but rather it's for the Lord's sake. In verse 15, we see that this kind of submission is the will of God. Now, there might be somebody here this morning that is searching and, and trying to discern what God's will is for you. Can I say this is a great place to start? Because you have it here right in black and white, don't you? This is the will of God for you. In verse 16, we find that when we submit, we are living as servants 
of God. Verse 19, we are told to be mindful of God. In verse 20, we see that suffering because of our submission is a gracious thing in the sight of God. I want to call your attention to verse 15 where Peter writes that when we submit to governmental authorities, we put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. We put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. Now that word translated ignorance does not just mean a lack of knowledge, right? That's how we use it today. Oh, they're ignorant of the facts. I heard that on the news one day this week. They said, well, they're just ignorant of the facts. Well, here, this word is more than just a lack of knowledge. What it describes is a willful, hostile rejection of the truth, right? It is an act of defiance. And so what Peter points uh, to here is that we are never going to silence that hostility and win people to Jesus by winning some political argument or advancing some cause. But we do that by submitting to governmental authority. That's how we do that. I'm reminded in the book of Titus, where we see the portion of scripture that talks about avoiding foolish conversations and then staying away from foolish arguments. Why? Well, because of this. Giving God glory isn't just something that we speak, but it shows up in how we conduct ourselves in submitting to governmental authority. Now I know that everyone here is a clean slate. I know that there are absolutely zero opinions of anything here, right? Yeah, we we all. We don't have those. We don't exercise those. We don't voice those. We just kind of go with the flow. You know what? We all do have opinions, don't we? Susie, what was that? Okay, Susie said, you better believe it. (laughs) We do. But you know what? How we respond to those is very important. And how we react to those is very important. You may not agree with certain types of legislation, There are ways to go about making that known. But a willful, a willful ignorance, a willful hostile rejection of that, Scripture tells us that is not what we are to do. Fourthly, biblical submission really is going to be a matter of the heart. It's going to be a matter of the heart. You know, you've heard the story of the little boy who was in a high chair and he kept trying to stand up. And his mother kept saying, hey, you need to sit down, sit down in that chair. And he would just stand up rigid just like this, standing on the chair. And finally, Dad would come in. Didn't you hate that? Dad would come in and would pick him up and sit him down. You know, the story goes, the little boy looked at Dad and said, I'm sitting, but I'm standing up on the inside. Y'all never been there? That might be you? Sometimes I think it is us. That's not the kind of submission that Peter is describing here. What he's describing is an attitude of the heart. Although we have been freed from slavery to all human institutions through Jesus, he calls us to submit willingly and freely to those same institutions. It's a matter of the heart. It's the, uh, uh, 
boy, I've never said this before. Uh, you don't have to. You get to. You get to, right? It's that same kind of principle. In verse 17, we see four commands that all deal with our heart attitudes. Uh, the first one is this, honor everyone. Honor them even if they are not honorable. It says to love the brotherhood, even if they are not lovable. Thirdly, it says this, fear God. Here's one. <laughs> he goes on to say, honor the emperor. Honor the emperor. Uh, to me, this is amazing. <coughs> You will recall in week one, we talked about what was going on in the geopolitical arena where Peter found himself at this time. What was going to happen very soon to Peter and Paul both? In spite of everything that was going on, Nero is the emperor. Nero is in charge. What does Peter write here? I know the emperor. What? Yeah, honor the emperor. At that time, there was no one more evil than he. And eventually, both of them would meet their death by his hand. Biblical submission really is an attitude of the heart. Honor everyone, love the brotherhood, fear God, and you know what? Honor the emperor. Was the emperor honorable? No. Was he lovable? Oh, no. Even his inner circle was scared to death of him for a good reason. Honor the emperor. That is an attitude of the heart. Number five, uh, every really does mean every. You know what, we can do all kinds of mental gymnastics to try and prove that when Peter writes every human institutions, he really didn't quite mean every. I've said it before and I'll say it again, I've used the word all, but the word every also applies. In the Greek, the word every means every, okay? There's no way you can get out of that. The language here is very clear, and Peter intentionally used the word every. It doesn't leave anything open to chance or ambiguity. It doesn't have another meaning. It really means every. <coughs> Peter further confirms that every means every when he writes that servants are to submit to their masters, even if they are unjust, and again, he uses the example of Christ. Paul confirms this same idea, Romans chapter 13, doesn't say, let every, it doesn't say let some people be subject to the governing authorities, it says let every person be subject to the governing authorities. There is no authority except from God. God has put them in place and those that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed. And those who resist will incur judgment. The language is clear. There is no authority except from God. You know what? Uh, we can all think of ungodly and unjust regimes throughout the world, evil governments. You know what? There are times where God has used those governments to see his purposes fulfilled, right? Think of it this way. There are times where God uses governments as acts of judgment. How many of us just love to be under judgment? We don't. I can guarantee you this. In the Old Testament, where they, where the children of Israel and, and Judah were carried off into captivity, that was not their thing. Who likes to live like that? And we can even bring that into the present 
day, we don't like that. But we need to stop and consider that every authority has been put in place by a sovereign God who knows much more than I. We also see this, uh, point number six, God is our ultimate authority. God is our ultimate authority. The idea is expressed here by, by Peter with his command that we are to fear God. We find that in verse 17. While our government officials deserve appropriate honor, they are not on the same level as God, are they? Okay? Uh, no fallible person will ever be on the same level as God. So while we are to honor other men, we are to fear God. There are laws that are in place that we as a church do not agree with. Okay. The one that comes to mind, which uh, for a long time has been something that the church has battled, has been the fight over abortion. I'm going to use that as an example. The law of our land says that that is acceptable. Scripture says it is not. Just because you can do something, it doesn't mean that you should. Can I say it that way? And there are a lot of flaws and a lot of, of, of issues that would coincide with that. There are going to be times when the command to fear God must take precedence over the command to honor governmental officials. Now, I want to be very careful with my wording here because I'm not saying if you disagree with something that you can become a vigilante. I'm not saying that at all. That's not what scripture teaches. When our government requires us to do something that would violate the clear commands in the Bible, we must choose to fear and obey God. Paul certainly understood this principle. Peter certainly understood this principle. You'll recall in Acts chapter 4, where Peter and John are brought before the Sanhedrin, the Sanhedrin says this, Stop proclaiming Christ. Commanded them not to preach, and Peter and John had a great answer. Uh, verses 19 and 20. Whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God, you must judge. For we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. They continued to preach Jesus. The apostles were arrested. Uh, we know the rest of the account where an angel came and freed them from prison. They entered the temple, began to preach about Jesus again. They were brought back before the council. They were reprimanded. What a mess. Acts chapter 5, verse 29. Peter and the apostles answered their charge with this. We must obey God rather than men. So Peter was certainly familiar with the exception to this command. And I say this is something that is very infrequent. If the government was to tell us that we need to close our church, never preach the name of Christ again, that is going to be something that is very, very different and not using your seatbelt. Do you see where I'm going with this? While it isn't frequent, it does happen. Let me say this, that for the Christian, our hope is not found in, in your favorite politician. <laughs> That's kind of an oxymoron, maybe. <laughs> our hope is not found in a politician. Our hope is found in Christ alone. Number seven, 
something that we need to understand. My submission will often lead to suffering. My submission will often lead to suffering. Unjust suffering. But when we do that and endure, I believe it's in verse 20, we see it's a gracious thing in the sight of God. Jesus experienced suffering because of his submission. Instead of rebelling or fighting back, he endured that submission and trusted his father that he would be taken care of and that things would be made right. Jesus saved me through his submission so that I can serve him through my submission. Up to this point, I've used a couple of concrete examples. Much of what we talked about could be in the realm of theory. So what practical steps can we take with this? Well, I think there's several as we prepare to close here this morning. First one is this, teach and model submission to our children. The idea of submission to authority begins in the Bible with the command to honor mom and dad. And I say that's something that is very lacking today. We must teach our children what it is to do that. So important. What does that look like? Well, we need to be the examples as parents, as grandparents, as adults, of what that does, in fact, look like. If your children watch you undermine the authority of their teachers, don't be surprised when they do the same. As adults, if you do not respect and honor your parents, don't expect your children to reciprocate that to you. If you are constantly complaining about the government in a disrespectful manner, they will pick up on that, and they too will do that. They won't even know what you know. <laughs> Maybe they'll know more than you know. I don't know. But we need to model this for them. Secondly, pray for those that are in authority. Pray for them. You may not agree with them. You may not have voted for them. You may not even like them, but pray for them. Paul wrote in 1 Timothy chapter 2, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgiving be made for all people. What does the word all mean? All. It's exactly what it means. Pray for kings who are in high positions that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. That is good and it is pleasing in the sight of God, our Savior, who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. Pray for that. Treat those in authority with respect, even when you may disagree with them. I want to say that we live in unprecedented times. I don't think that's totally accurate. I don't think that's true. I think every generation uh, has had its moments where they just thought the world has gone off the rails. Boy, I'm sure glad we don't think that today. You know what? You may not agree with them. You may not think the same way they do, but we are to treat those in authority with respect, even if we disagree. Uh, Titus chapter 3, verse 1, remind them to be submissive to rulers and authorities, to be obedient, to be ready for every good work, to speak evil of no one, to avoid quarreling, to be gentle and to show perfect courtesy toward all people. Can I say this? That includes the politicians that you don't like. That, agree, that uh, uh, also applies to uh, the authorities that maybe you don't quite understand or get. Notice it doesn't say that you have to agree with them, but what it does say is you have to treat them with respect. You have to show them honor. 
Jesus saved me through his submission so that I can serve him through my submission. We submit for the Lord's sake. We submit because we are following the example of Jesus who submitted so that we could have forgiveness of sin, so that we could have salvation full and free, knowing that our submission to human authority brings glory to God and leads to the expansion of his kingdom. Is this an easy thing to do? Oh my goodness, no. It certainly isn't. But can I say that's exactly why it's here? Because we need to hear that, we need to get that, we need to understand that. It's okay to disagree with policies. It's okay to disagree uh, with what you see going on. In the age of social media, one of the things that I find most distressing is when we as children of God will take a look at so many of these issues and as children of God we will express ourselves in the most ungodly of ways. It's not what submission looks like. I'm firmly convinced that we would pray for them as much as we disparage them you know what? It might not change the law. <laughs> it might not change them. Guaranteed it will change you. That's what submission looks like. Loving Father, we take a, a text that we find in your word. And Lord, we look at that and it's very easy for us to sit back and to say, that's okay for the other guy. But I don't need to do that. Yet your word tells us we do. Father, I pray this morning that we would just simply be obedient. And Lord, everything that comes out of our mouth would bring you glory. And that means doing exactly what your word has shown us this morning. Father, may we be respectful always. May we give honor always. May we pray even more in Jesus' name.